welcome to the final night of the 2011 Birch Shore Museum and Sculpture Gardens Summer Camp Film Festival, <coughs> Sloss Reference. As Glenn said, my name is Dave Wilt. This makes six years that I've been introducing the Summer Camp Films. Hopefully, we'll all be back for another series next year. The Hershorn staff, beginning with Kelly Gordon, who's the behind-the-scenes mastermind of the summer camps, and all the other people who make this series possible, deserve our thanks. It's true they show these films as part of a secret plan to lure you into an art museum so you can absorb some culture, but that's a small price to pay for a quality entertainment. Tonight's film is Earth vs. the Flying Saucer, released in 1956. There are several particular points I'd like to mention before the film begins. Earth vs. the Flying Saucer could be considered a sort of amalgam of this year's two previous Saucerifers features, taking certain aspects of both the day the Earth stood still and the War of the Worlds and pushing them into a single film. Like the day the Earth stood still, this movie is largely set in Washington, D.C. Even though the city has changed a lot in the last 50 odd years, it's still fun to see familiar sites and monuments and federal buildings in a movie. Also reminiscent of the day the Earth stood still is the whole, oops, my bad aspect of the plot, where some Earth dudes issue trigger finger turns an awkward but initially peaceful meeting between Earthlings and aliens into a galactic slugfest. Way to go. Unlike the day the Earth stood still, where Platoon's saucer simply landed peacefully on the mall and only killed some grass, in tonight's film, we get to watch the Washington Monument and so forth all get whacked by alien stations. Not only that, but as in the War of the Worlds, the destruction is global. Yes, Big Bang, then, and other international landmarks also suffer the wrath of the irritated aliens. Here's the original trailer for the movie. If you remember last week, we showed the trailer for The War of the Worlds, which promised a spectacle of destruction. This trailer also concentrates on the film's strong points, the attack of the saucers. Flying saucers have invaded our planet. Washington, London, Paris, Moscow are key targets. The whole world is under attack. Can it survive? survivors of a disintegrated solar system. At this moment, the remainder of our fleet is circling your globe. What do you want with me? Arrange for your world leaders to confer with us in the city of Washington. They set up an electronic screen. The artillery doesn't penetrate. Never before has the screen reached such heights of excitement. Breathtaking spectacle. Hair-raising terror. See the saucer men's high frequency disintegrator. See flying saucers travel thousands of miles in seconds. See great cities leveled by flying saucer monsters. Last one. The same kind of thing that's watched us since the beginning of the project. People of Earth, attention. People of Earth, attention. This is a voice speaking to you from thousands of miles beyond your planet. They're coming down to take over. They made that clear to us in the saucer. To the best of our knowledge, my wife and I are the only ones left alive. One curious aspect of this movie, which can be glimpsed in the trailer, in fact, is the emphasis on including the Soviet Union as part of the world community under attack by the saucers. This was made in 1956, after all, during the Cold War. Interestingly enough, one of the screenwriters of the film was the politically blacklisted Bernard Gordon, who's credited on screen under the name Raymond T. Marcus. 
Like any decent D picture, Earth versus the flying saucers was careful to strip away most of the extraneous material that cluttered up the more expensive, high-class movies like The Day the Earth Stood Still and War of the Worlds. Useless things like likable protagonists, the character development and growth, and dramatic human interaction. <laughs> Actually, such narrative niceties were generally anathema to special effects supervisor Ray Harryhausen, and he admitted that he wanted his special effects, not some silly love story, to be the center of attention. Ray Harryhausen was born in Los Angeles in 1920, and his first professional work was as an animator for George Powell's Puppetoons in the early 1940s. Powell, of course, was the producer of The War of the Worlds, last week's film. Harry Housen later worked as an assistant to Willis O'Brien, a special effects genius who created the original King Kong's stop motion animation. By the early 1950s, however, Harry Housen was the preeminent stop motion animator of Hollywood, and his effects became the selling point of the films he worked on. Earth vs. the Flying Saucers is a rare example of a Harry Housen film in which his effects are used to animate objects which are non living and non humanoid. In other words, not giant monsters, not sword-fighting skeletons, not animals, not statues, and so forth, but machines. In fact, the aliens in Earth vs. the Flying Saucers were designed by Harry Hobson, but were portrayed by men in suits and not animated for budgetary reasons. <laughs> Making this movie, Harry Hobson was faced with two challenges. First, making flying saucers, in essence machines, interesting, even giving them a sort of personality as was done to a lesser extent with the Martian machines in War of the Worlds last week. Second, animating flying objects is inherently difficult. Ray Harryhausen used stop-motion dimensional animation techniques. This means using physical models, posing them, taking a picture, moving them incrementally, a fraction of an inch, taking another picture, moving them again, taking another picture, moving them again, and so on. This requires very tedious and painstaking work, but imagine how much more difficult this would be if you had to suspend your model in midair. Harryhausen's father made seven flying saucer models of various sizes for her first flying saucers. Most of these still exist, and in fact, several of them were recently sold at auction for $50,000 or more. The models were suspended in the air during the animation process by very, very thin wires as they were positioned, photographed, positioned, moved, photographed, etc., etc. Images of the wires themselves had to be painstakingly removed from the final shots by retouching the film. Before the advent of computer animation, spaceships and movies were usually created with the use of physical models, spaceships and airplanes, anything that could fly. Not animated models, but literally little toys, little models of rockets or flying saucers shot in real time flying across the set on strings or wires, or by using cartoon animation, or by optically inserting images on film, or a combination of methods. The Harryhausen flying saucers are almost unique and are certainly the most active, maneuverable, and lively spacecraft in cinema of their era and for many, many years afterwards. Here we have a few examples of space travel as depicted in other films. The first clip is from George Méliès' A Trip to the Moon, made in 1902. Méliès borrows the idea from Jules Verne and H.G. Wells, suggesting people can travel through space in large capsules fired from cannons. Twenty-five years later, Fritz Lang made the considerably more realistic The Woman in the Moon, using a model rocket and then animation to show spaceflight. The countdown to blast-off allegedly originated in this movie and then began to be used in real-life rocket launches several decades later.
A rather steampunk looking model rocket appeared in the 1935 Flash Gordon serial. Although rather clunky and slow, the actual fire coming out of the back of the model is a nice touch. The day the Earth stood still used optical effects to show Klaatu's saucer passing over some very familiar buildings. Then superimposes a model of the saucer over live action footage as it lands on the mall. The Rocky Jones Space Ranger television program of the early 1950s optically superimposes footage of a cartoon rocket and real flames on a photographic background. The model flying saucer in Devil Girl from Mars is quite detailed and impressive, although I still think it resembles some sort of kitchen device like a salad spinner or crock pot or something. Plan 9 from Outer Space utilizes the quintessential hubcaps dangling on strings special effects technique. Compare all of these to the stop motion animation in tonight's movie and you will see why Earth vs. the Flying Saucers is even today remembered for the excellence of its special effects.